2 Corinthians 12. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about fourteen years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very cheapest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear, lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest 
When I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness, and fornication, and lasciviousness which they have committed. Good evening, September the 4th, 2014. That would be a Thursday. This is your host, Mike Callahan, and welcome to the Watchman News. I wanted to point something out there real quick before we move on to uh, to the news. Um, in verse 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such in one caught up to the third heaven. Third heaven. A lot of people, they just, they, they want to omit so many things out of the Bible, and that is a key thing that people often omit out of the Bible. The third heaven. If there's a third heaven, there surely must be a first heaven and a second heaven. But you won't hear people speak about that much. Not at all. A lot of times, if you would go into a church and you would talk to the pastor or the preacher or whatever, whatever uh, that particular clergy member is called, you know, he will tell you, you know, oh, there's only one heaven. There's only what you know, three heavens. That's crazy talk. I've seen it. I've had the discussions. So I wanted to point that out. You know, they say when in Rome. And we were, well, not in Rome, but we happened to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So I figured I would uh, I would point that out. So anyway, uh, we've got some varying news for you tonight. Um, I guess we might as well just get it started off the right way with suspicious observers and go from there, huh? Uh, as always, the link's down in the About tab. And uh, if you want to watch it yourself or go to his channel and subscribe or whatever the case may be, so without any further ado, Suspicious Observers. Good morning, folks. Let's start with the feature from Nature Video that blew my mind. The link to the full video and explanation is found in the link list below, and I highly recommend you click it. Scientists have claimed to map our position in the cosmos unlike ever before, going beyond just the electrically connected web of galaxies to seeing how the great attractor affects everything in the local supercluster. What they've come up with is a tremendous cosmological feature of wispy tendrils that makes up an enormous amount of galaxies in itself. Our supergroup is but one of two mapped by these scientists, and it is called Laniakea. The top solar story of the day is an M2.5 solar flare that erupted from the incoming southern sunspots. The CME was minor and not Earth-directed. Looking at the sunspots, I will call yesterday the short-range trough of activity as the southern incoming limb looks absolutely diabolical. Good test for the Earth-facing quiet. And even the northern megaspots are becoming visible today, just cresting the limb this morning. Solar wind is leveling off and fairly much calming. Finally, we're free of magnetic instability in the Earth system. Solar polar fields update. It is indeed looking like the last reversal of the North may be the finale. Still got a lot of readings to come, but as of now, the North has stayed positive, which is what we've looked for. The earthquakes continued around the eastern ring of fire with the 5.9 in Easter Island and two five-pointers in the Cayman Islands. Also, downgrade for the ages as this 6.0 was read at various higher magnitudes all the way up to 6.9 by a seismologist rather than a computer. Something dear to my heart, unfortunately the opponents to GMO labeling including Coca-Cola and Monsanto are dumping cash into the issue trying to stave off having to label their food as genetically modified. On top of every other reason to hate this crime against nature, I offer some insight in an open letter about the microbiology issue on our blog link to that can be found below as well. Well, Dolly is dead over Mexico, but Norbert is a hurricane in the eastern Pacific, still potential to whack Baja, 
but also potential to hit San Diego if that one track proves out. Something to watch. The major storm watch today again falls near the U.S.-Canada border as the heat and moisture all flows towards that primary low sucking in. Heed the alerts tonight. Same high dominates in Europe, leaving the same southeastern warnings as yesterday in this area. We'll flip on the precipitable water overlay down under to see the two lows of note for this region. The Mobile Observatory project is in Surrey today, just outside Vancouver. Then it's back to the United States. Got some shots of our star to close at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 3.30 a.m. in British Columbia. That's the news. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone. And thanks to Ben Davison, Suspicious Observers. Always does a, a good job keeping us updated on our favorite star. Well, I hope it's your favorite star. Seems to be one of the most important stars. Anyway, I've got lots of news for you. Uh, I guess I can start out with, uh, I guess it's official. I uh, updated my relationship status as of today. Um, <laughs> Kind of interesting. Had a little bit of a, a, a rant associated with that. Um, so, uh, me, me and a uh, me and a young woman decided we wanted to give things a shot. And uh, of course, as you know, it's, it's it's not official unless you go to social media and update it there. So, it was kind of uh, frustrating. Somebody, and I'm I'm not going to out anybody or anything like that, but somebody felt it was upon themselves to uh, to try and impress uh, how they would do things, the order they would do things. Um, those of you that were following from the very beginning uh, would know that uh, I had had a separation um, from my soon-to-be ex. Um, and that, that separation started in, back in January, and uh, I, I was I was informed that I should do things in the right order. I just wanted to point this out again. I, I'm I'm not trying to out anybody, but I wanted to point out the amount and the type of authoritarianism there is in this country, and just how bad people think that. They should run other people's lives, and you know, I'll tell you how I responded to it, uh, and, and this is how I recommend anybody respond to that type of situation. I uh, took a picture of my shoes, and I posted it, and I said, "Feel free." I, I, I forget exactly the words I said, but it was a, uh, it was it was something to that effect. I'll, I'll find it real quick and look. Um. Yeah, I mean, really, it's it's absurd that that uh, people just can't live their life and and other people respect that. Yeah, I said feel free at any time, you know, and it was an it, it was in reference to you know walking a mile in my shoes <clears throat> because they don't know the whole situation. I mean, I had talked to this person a little bit uh, and and told her a little bit, uh, but but she doesn't know all the details. Uh, nor am I going to let anyone know all the details except for those that need to know. It's a need-to-know basis kind of thing, and um, I just thought that was absurd. Not only, you know, I, I w it really wouldn't have bothered me so much had they sent it in a private message uh, and had a, a private conversation with me, um, but to, to publicly make that post... Uh, informing everybody and their brother of, of their thoughts that was pretty bold that was that was uh, that was really really bold uh, coming from someone that complains about one of the fathers of her children not having anything to do with their child but at the same time does nothing but complains about this person on social media it, it just and again not trying to out them not trying to even attack them but that's just how you know people are these days, and I, I know everybody's not that way, but it just it just uh, it's sad. And when people are like that, you kind of you know call them out, call them out. You know, I, I'm not here to name and shame or anything like that, but uh, you know, I, I surely called it out in uh, 
in my particular situation. Call people out like that. Don't let that kind of activity continue. Um, it's 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 several things. It's authoritarianism. It's 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 actually, in my opinion, a form of bullying. Even so, you know, don't don't let that fly. If you have that happen in your life, deal with it. Nip it in the bud, as they used to say, and then uh, and then go from there. So let's get on with the the real news because my life isn't real news. My life is pretty lame. So real news. Uh, McCain. Infowars. I don't think I got the link down there um, because I found this after I'd set up the show. So anyway. Uh, at the one minute mark in the short clip, you're going to hear uh, are with Better Grand Sustern, McCain mentions a meeting the president held with his national security team in which all members reportedly recommended arming ISIS. Hillary Clinton has described already the meeting in the White House over two years ago. Everyone in the national security team recommended arming ISIS and the president by himself turned it down, McCain said. The comment follows a question from uh Sisterian, I don't know how to pronounce her name, regarding the army of the free Syrian army, making McCain's statement appear to be simple a simple Freudian slip. While some experts have taken the remark out of context, McCain's unintended comment regarding ISIS still remains completely factual. Despite McCain falsely claiming that the president declined the arm the, to arm the group, the pair's direct involvement in the rise of ISIS a name simply referring to Al-Qaeda in Iraq is undeniable. So let me play that, uh, let me let me play this video clip and you can hear it yourself. Oh, why aren't we hearing that? Oh, I know why. Pardon me. Hang on. I apologize. Here we go. I have a strategy to fit that goal and policies that will implement it. We have none of the above. The president, uh, incredibly, the other day said that the world is messy and it's social networking that, uh, I mean, that, that to me was one of the most unbelievable comments that I've ever made. But we've, the, first of all, we have to understand that ISIS has obliterated the boundary between Iraq and Syria. You've got to go after them in both places, and you can't do it with half measures, and you need to use full weight of American air power. That will require some more boots and support on the ground, and it can succeed. We can stop them. And finally, Greta, all this didn't have to happen. We could have left a force behind in Iraq that would have stabilized Iraq, and we are paying an incredible price for the presence leading from behind, whether it be in Iraq or Syria or Libya or a number of other countries in the Middle East. Well, we are seeing the chickens coming home to roost. I want to throw a little more salt in the wound if we'd also um, help finance the Free Syrian Army, the moderates who might not have seen ISIS become so successful in Syria because now, like a metastasis, they Hillary, have spread into Iraq. Hillary Clinton has described already the meeting in the White House over two years ago. Everyone in the national security team recommended uh, arming ISIS and the president by himself turned it down, just like by himself he decided not to strike Syria after he said that they'd crossed the red line. There's no ability. If the president and John Kerry keep talking about coalitions, how are you going to form coalition with people who do not trust you, who know you are totally unreliable? First, there has to be a restoration of American credibility. You know, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any Democrats come out in support of President Obama, and then now they have dialed it back oh, a little real, bit. They were real back in, and that's why the president gave the, the press conference that he did. Well, maybe some folks uh, were a little bit uh, out here uh, too far. Look, 192,000 people slaughtered in Syria, and this, is a, um, this world is a messy world? I mean, I, I, I have to tell you, and I've told you this before, I'm heartbroken about what's happened in Syria, and we have to stop ISIS not stop them, but we have to defeat them. And there's no doubt in my mind or anyone else's that they are a threat sooner or later. Interesting rhetoric from uh, State Department or White House spokesman. We don't know of a specific threat. 
but we don't know of a specific threat. But I have known no national security expert that doesn't believe that they are going to pose a direct threat because that's what they're capable of doing. So what do you think the president's thinking? I think that he's trying to stick to his campaign, two campaigns, 2000, 2012, 2008, 2012, where he said, we're going to uh, lead from behind, we're going to get out of everywhere, and there's going to be uh, this tide of wars receding, Bashar Assad, it's not a matter of whether, but when he leaves power. You can go through a long list of things the president has said and stood for have been completely wrong. And as you and I have discussed before, Bill Clinton changed his strategy after Severnitsa, Jimmy Carter changed his, George W. Bush changed his after seeing that we were failing in Iraq. And he can too. But apparently that he, he, he uh, I, don't, I don't understand because the facts on the ground dictate it. Could I just say one word about Ukraine? If we do not help Ukrainians, there's going to be a worse for slaughter, there's going to be a land bridge to Crimea and Moldova and the Baltic countries are going to be threatened incredibly. We will not give the Ukrainians sensitive uh, intelligence information or supply them with weapons. Now the Germans may be. Well, I'm grateful for the Germans for the first time in a long time. Do you think he has a plan or a strategy he's not, just not telling us or do you think he has no plan and he's winging it. There are plans that have been developed in the Pentagon, and the CIA, and the State Department. I know for a fact there's all kinds of plans so out there. So just can't make just a decision? Just like there were targets out there that they could have struck if he'd wanted to. It's up to the president. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, did he say Worcester move? <laughs> sorry, that, uh, that caught me there. That really did. So, um, yeah, we, we already know this stuff. We already know that it was uh, our military that trained them. We already know we funded them. We already know we're sending at 16s I want to say it's Friday tomorrow. Um, that's going to wind up in their hands. Uh, and I just, again, I, I have to remind people it's frustrating, you know, you don't go to O'Reilly's or AutoZone or whatever and buy a manual for these aircraft, these Apache helicopters, these F-16s, and learn how to fly them. You don't get in and start flipping switches and turning knobs and saying, "Oh, well, this is this is easy." Um, it's it's not like that. It's just not like that. And their tactics, their advanced tactics, and their it, it just it's it's pretty evident. It really is. It's pretty evident. Um, let's get on with the other news. Uh, <laughs> have something else going on that's kind of humorous. So anyway, Russian general calls for preemptive nuclear strike doctrine against NATO. A Russian general has called for Russia to revamp its military doctrine, last updated in 2010, to clearly identify the U.S. and its NATO allies as allies, allies. <laughs> I sound as bad as McCain, as Mas Moscow's enemy number one, and to spell out the conditions under which Russia would launch a preemptive nuclear strike against the 28-member military alliance, Interfax reported Wednesday. Russia's military doctrine, a strategy document, through which the government interprets military threats and crafts possible responses, is being revised in light of the threats connected to the Arab Spring, the Syrian civil war and conflict in Ukraine, the deputy chief of the Kremlin Security Council told RIA Novosti on Tuesday. But within the defense ministry, there are voices calling for different priorities. First and foremost, the likely enemy of Russia should be clearly identified in this tragic doc strategic document. Boy, it's rough. <laughs> Something absent from the 2010 military doctrine. In my view, our primary enemy is the U.S. and the North Atlantic Bloc. General Yuri Yakubov, something like that, a senior defense ministry official was quoted as saying by Interfax, the 2010 doctrine defines NATO expansion as a threat to Russian national security and reaffirms its right to use nuclear weapons in a defensive posture. That stops far short 
of declaring NATO as Moscow's primary adversary and laying preemptive nuclear strike scenarios on the table, a posture unmistakably reminiscent of the Cold War. Yakubov said the information war being waged over the crisis in Ukraine, where the West accuses Russia of arming separatists fighting in the government in Kiev, and NATO's announcement that it would establish a permanent military presence in Eastern Europe have validated earlier fears that the alliance's claims of non-aggression towards Russia were insincere. The general added that special attention should be paid to the integrating, uh, to integrating the functions of the newly created air and space defense forces with Russia, land, sea, and air-based nuclear forces. In addition, it is necessary to hash out the conditions under which Russia could carry out a preemptive strike in the Russian strategic rocket forces, he said. So, one thing that, that gets me is, uh, is this gentleman said that the information war being waged over the crisis in Ukraine where the West accuses Russia of arming separatists fighting the government in Kiev. So this is interesting that, they, they, that this is said because we're sitting there arming ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and I don't think there's much doubt that we're doing that. That's pretty well, you know, that's not conspiracy theory. That's conspiracy fact. There's a difference, okay? So we're sitting there doing this stuff and then accusing Russia, you know, and I'm not saying whether Russia's doing, the, uh, you know, arming the separatists or not. I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. We may be doing it and then blaming Russia. Oh, no, we would never do that. No. No, we wouldn't be behind nothing to do with chemical weapons in Syria or anything like that. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. We're, we're innocent. It's a game. It's a game. They're trying to get public support. And the only way they're going to do it is by doing things that plays on the American people that, as a majority have lost the ability and the desire to think critically and uh, and call them out on it. But I have faith. I do. I have faith, the faith, the faith. I'm kidding. I can't sing. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> so anyway, I do, I do have faith that there's enough people waking up in this country and uh, and I, I think everything, I, I think things are going to turn around. I'm not going to say I think everything's going to be all right, but I think things are going to turn around. I, I believe in the good book, man, and, uh, and, and women, <laughs> and I know who wins. That's, that's, uh, that's what's important to me. So going on with this issue in Russia, Russia planning major nuclear military exercises, and you notice this is all nuclear stuff, and by the way, this is the Moscow Times. Okay, so this isn't U.S. propaganda. See what I'm saying? This is uh, this is this is articles from from Russia. So you know, eh. I'm not saying it's not propaganda from them. But I mean, come on, are you going to say, oh, that's conspiracy theory? They're not doing these exercises. I, I would hope not. Would hope not. The forces responsible for Russia's strategic nuclear arsenal will conduct major exercises this month involving more than 4,000 soldiers. The defense ministry said on Wednesday in the latest sign of rising tension with NATO over the Ukraine crisis. In an announcement a day before the start of a NATO summit in Wales, RIA news agency quoted the ministry as saying the exercises would take place in Altai and central, or South Central Russia and would also include around 400 technical units and use uh, an extensive use of air power. The agency quoted Dmitry yeah, Andreev, a major, a major in the strategic rocket forces, as saying troops would practice countering irregular units and high precision weapons and conducting combat missions in conditions of active radio electronic jamming and intensive in uh, intensive enemy actions in areas of troop deployment. He said enemy forces would be represented in the exercises by Spetsnaz, Special Forces Units, supersonic MiG-31 fighter interceptors, and SU-24 MR reconnaissance aircraft would take part. He said saying the scale of air power involved was unprecedented for exercises of this kind. 
Both Russia and NATO have stepped up military maneuvers since the outbreak of conflict in Ukraine between government forces and pro-Russian separatists in the east of uh, in the east of the former Soviet Republic. A Kremlin security advisor said Tuesday that Russia would update its military doctrine this year in light of the Ukraine crisis and the sharp deterioration in, re in relations with NATO. And that uh, that military doctrine was what I just read to you previously. So it's something to keep an eye on. Russia's talking about preemptive strikes. We know Obama has updated our doctrines, if you want to call them that, on preemptive strikes. Uh, many, many years ago, we started preparing and, and getting ready and doing exercises for preemptive strikes. We know that Everybody and their brother, all that, you know, China, us, Russia, you know, they're all working on hypersonic nuclear weapons. Um, and, and believe me, if they're telling us that they're working on it, then they've got it perfected. <laughs> so hang on to your hats, you know. I mean, it, it's, I surely can't make the call. I don't think any of us can. And, uh, and those that are truly pulling the strings... Uh, will do whatever they deem necessary, uh, especially if the, the, the quicker people catch on to what's going on and call them out on it, the quicker something very big is going to happen um, because they're not just going to, okay, we're sorry, you know, we won't do it again. It ain't, it ain't going to work like that. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get out of Russia. Let's get back in the United States. However, let's talk about Russian guns. Yay, AK-47s. You went to the website. Hey, you can have it. Hey, hoser. I'm a ban on Russian Kalashnikov rifles first AK-47 buying frenzy in the U.S. U.S. President Barack Obama's ban on the import of Russian Kalashnikov rifles intended as a punishment for Moscow's incursion into Ukraine has had an unintended consequence, an AK-47 buying frenzy in U.S. gun stores. Now, I want to point out how that is spun off. That is not being done as punishment. What that is being done is to further the gun control agenda um, and, and I believe they're going to say that down there. But uh, I see it. But, uh, yeah, that's what it's for. It's, it's, just, it's just an excuse. Firearms dealers reported a surge in demand as buyers rushed out to get the weapon. They pretty much cleaned us out, said Brian Bunting, the president of Atlantic Firearms, a gun business in Maryland. He estimated that a White House announcement on July 6 led to a tripling of demand for the Kalashnikovs, with prices for a mid-range rifle rising uh, from $850 to $1,050. Wow. It is still possible to import AK-47s made in former Soviet bloc countries such as Poland or Romania, or even to buy weapons produced in the U.S. But the Russian-made weapons designed for the Red Army by Mikhail Kalashnikov are considered the classic by gun aficionados. Now, personally, I like the SKS. It's it's a forged heavy argument kind of thing, but you know the SKS has a a, a heavier barrel, and yada 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 yada. Um, the problem with the SKS is is uh, no two are exactly alike. So sometimes when you go swapping out parts or whatever, you buy aftermarket parts, you might have issues with them fitting correctly. So that's something to to uh, keep in mind. That's one way the AK-47 is is much nicer. Plus, it's just it's it's really easier easier to uh, sporterize or modify or whatever term you want to use an AK-47 over an SKS. But I do like that heavier barrel of the SKS. But let's get off my opinion about firearms. Um, if you think wine, you think French wine. If you think Kalashnikovs, you think Russian Kalashnikovs. Mr. Bunting said, and that's true. Uh, same with SKXs. It's it's known in the firearms uh, world or whatever you want to call it that the Russian SKS is uh, is the one you want. So the sanctions prohibit the import of new weapons made by Kalashnikov. Concern concern and ban sales of already imported weapons that would financially benefit the company. Some gun supporters see a hidden motive. 
arguing that Mr. Obama is using the crisis in Ukraine as a way to sneak in the gun control agenda that failed in the months after Sandy Hook massacre. And so you can buy an AK-47 or an SKS, you can buy that for the most part a lot cheaper than you can uh, any type of AR-15 variant, or at least you could, not now, obviously. The National Rifle Association said it was more than a little unsettling that the san sanctions seemed to align with Mr. Obama's goal of banning some assault weapons, according to the Washington Post. And that's exactly what is going on here. They've tried all kinds of goofiness, and people were getting around it. They were, you know, passing laws that it can't have the the uh, lug on the front of it that that a uh, that a bayonet, you know, the bayonet lug. Uh, that you can't have a firearm with the ban. I mean, they, they were doing everything they could to get these weapons, and that was before the Ukraine incident. So, you know, I call bogus. I call bogus. They're just doing everything they can um, to, to stop it, and it's sickening. It really is. You know, give it up. Give it up. Gun control. Uh, getting rid of the firearms is not going to happen. It's just not. I, I, I don't see it. Not in this country. You know, they, they might have been able to fool people in other countries, but I, I just don't. Not right now, anyway. Maybe in about another two generations, maybe they might be able to do it, but not right now. So yesterday, let's move on. Yesterday I did a report on, I believe it was in the state of Washington. Uh, if I'm wrong, I apologize. I believe it was in the state of Washington. Um, there was uh, police that were starting to carry these uh, these devices with them, and I'm trying to think of the name of it. Now I'm having a hard time thinking the name of it, but it w it would imitate a cell phone tower, and they could go around and they could actually take your data, your texts, and all your information basically from your cell phone. And this isn't again, this isn't conspiracy theory kind of stuff. I mean. The, the police there, it might have been Portland, Oregon. It might have been Portland, Oregon. The police there uh, actually made a statement about using the devices and, and you know, craziness, craziness. So anyway, I'm thinking on, on the news about these cell towers once before. I think I did an InfoWars report or I talked about it or whatever. And... Uh, so anyway, we're going to do a report. I mean, these are real too. Again, you notice this is CBS Chicago. This isn't some kind of, you know, this isn't the Onion or this isn't, you know, it's not even InfoWars. I mean, rogue cell towers can intercept your data. At least one found in Chicago. <laughs> At least one, huh? So-called rogue cell phone towers, the type that can intercept your mobile calls and data, are cropping up all over the United States, including here in Chicago according to a company that specializes in developing highly secure mobile phones. More cell phone users who fear their information could be at risk are turning to high-end secure mobile devices. As a result, it is becoming easier for them to detect the presence of these interceptor devices. The origin of these devices that disguise themselves as cell phone towers is not known. <laughs> not known. CBS2 security analyst Bob uh, Ross Rice Okay. A former FBI agent said it's likely being used illegally. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it is. It's, you know, a violation of our Constitution. Thank you, NSA. I doubt that they are installed by law enforcement as they require a warrant to intercept conversations or data. And since cell phone pro uh, providers are ordered by the court to cooperate with the intercept, there really would be no need for this, Rice said. Okay, well, if if you go back and you listen to the report I did yesterday, uh, a judge, you know, well, wait, no, the judge didn't quite say that they didn't need anything. The judge, as far as I know, didn't really say much either way. But, yeah, I mean, come on, let's let's get real here. <laughs> they're towers. They're, they're cell phone towers. All right, some somebody like me and you aren't putting these things up. We're not. It's the government, it's the NSA, it's whoever. You put whatever letters to it, that doesn't matter. A rose smells like a rose. It's the government, and they're they're invading every single bit of our lives. 
Most likely, they are installed and operated by hackers trying to steal personal identification and passwords. Les Goldsmith, the CEO, uh, CEO of ESD America, which makes secure cell phones, said law enforcement with a warrant can use interceptor devices if they need the information in real time or if they don't want a cellular network to know what they are tracking. These devices don't look like a tower, but are rather electronic boxes and laptops that trick a regular phone that is part of an actual cellular network. How did ASD customers discover these interceptor devices? ESD America's cell phones protects users' data, phone calls, and text. The phone looks like a typical Android phone, but the inside includes encryption uh, <laughs> algorithms developed by a German com uh, company, GSMK, that protects the phone from intercepts. ESD has asked them to report when their devices detect a threat. As a result, the company recently published a map showing 19 such eavesdropping devices across the country, including at least one in Chicago. ESD said it is, says it is able to verify each customer's report. ESD says on his Facebook page that there are likely many, many more so-called phony towers. The more phones we have out there, the more we will see, said Goldsmith. The company's top-of-the-line GSMK crypto phone, the CP500, has a firewall that constantly monitors all activity on the phone. When a user gets an alert that a cell tower has no neighboring towers, um, legitimate towers from the phone companies from a network, it indicates the cell tower is potentially a danger to the user's security. ESD can only rely on location information of the reported interceptors based on the user's report. In the case of the Chicago interceptor, the user simply reported it as near the airport but didn't specify whether it was Midway or O'Hare. The top-of-the-line ESD phone costs around $3,500. Goldsmith said they do a lot of business with governments but are selling more privately, including the 200 units today alone. <laughs> yeah, good luck. You don't see me buying one. You could probably get a firewall if you look around. You could probably find this stuff for your Android phone, your regular Android phone. I'm sure they probably have an app out there that will help you do the same thing and save yourself the, what was it, $3,500? That's ridiculous. Uh, oh, it's in the name of security. And, it, and let me tell you something. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many firewalls, antivirus, blah, 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 you put on your PC. It does not matter. The government has back doors that they use. There's nothing you're going to do to keep them out. So just, you know, whatever. It's 1984. Just accept it and, uh, and, and deal with it. You know, turn off the television and deal with it. Speak up. Speak out. Explain it to somebody that doesn't know about it. You know, it's not going to stop unless we stop it. It's just going to get worse. It's that simple. I'd, I'd like to, you know, feed you fairy tales and go ride my unicorn and go look at the rainbows, but can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. Wouldn't be prudent at this juncture. So anyway, on to the next story. This comes from Washington Post. I was going to do this story yesterday, and it kind of shows you the type of society that we live in today. And I wanted to share this story because I just thought it was, you know, you know, I can see if you're concerned with something, you know, especially when it involves children and stuff. I, I could see a little bit of concern, um, but wow, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. We, I, I guess in a situation like this, I guess I would personally, and again, it's this is me, I would personally approach and uh, and and to strike up a little conversation, you know, hey, how you doing, you know, see if the guy acts nervous, you know, the guy. Let me read the story, and I just, you know, I was taking pictures of my daughters. A stranger thought I was exploiting them. After my family arrives on the Cape May Ferry to our annual vacation to the Jersey Shore, I take pictures of our two daughters on the ferry's deck as we leave the harbor. I've been doing this since they were three and four years old. They are now 16 and 17. 
each photo chronicles one year in the life of our family and our daughter's growth into the beautiful young women they have become. Getting just the right exposure and interaction between the two has never been easy. They've gone from squirming toddlers to ambivalent teens who barely put up with their dad's ongoing photography project. But this year, everything was perfect. It has been an extraordinary summer in the Mid-Atlantic, mild heat with low humidity. On the first day of vacation, the sea was calm and the sky was a brilliant blue. As I focused on the image in my camera's viewfinder, the girls stood in their usual spot against the railing at the back of the boat. I was looking for just the right pose, often waiting for that perfect smile or pausing as they fixed their hair after a strong ocean breeze. I was trying to get just the right exposure and flash combination to bring out their faces in the harsh midday sun. Totally engaged with the scene in front of me, I jumped when a man came up beside me and said to my daughters, I would be remiss if I didn't ask if you were okay. At first, none of us understood what he was talking about. His polite tone and tourist attire of shorts, polo shirt, and baseball cap threw us off. It took me a moment to figure out what he meant. But then it hit me. He thought I might be exploiting the girls, taking questionable photos for one of those exotic beauties want to meet you websites or something just as unseemly. When I explained to my daughters what he was talking about, they were understandably confused. I told the man I was their father. He quickly apologized and turned away. But that perfect moment was ruined, and our annual photo shoot was over. Only after we arrived at our rented condo did I find out I had gotten a great shot. As I was telling my wife what had happened, I saw the man again, scanning the horizon with his binoculars. The more I thought about what, had, uh, what he had said, the more upset I became. My wife and I, both white, adopted our two daughters in China when they were infants. Over the years, as a transracial family, we have often gotten strange looks and intrusive questions from strangers, but nothing like this. Yet part of me understood what he was seeing. Here was this middle-aged white guy taking lots of pictures of two beautiful young Asian women. Would this man have approached us, I wondered, if I had been Asian, like my children, or if my daughters had been white? No, I didn't think so. I knew I'd regret not going back to speak to him about what had happened. My wife warned me I might be asking for trouble, but I reassured her that I would be fine. I walked outside to where he was standing and calmly said, Excuse me, sir, but you just embarrassed me in front of my children and strangers, and what you said was racist. The man didn't seem at all phased, he replied. I work for the Department of Homeland Security, and let me give you some advice. You were standing there taking photos of them hugging for 15 minutes. I see. So we didn't fit the mold of what considered a typical American family, and he thought my picture taking was excessive possibly depraved. How long should my family snap tops take? He thought he was qualified to judge. I told him I was a professional photographer. I take a uh, photographer and take lots of photos. My wife's a photographer, he said. I understand. Then you should have known better, I replied. He agreed to consider everything I had said, but he didn't sound very sincere. When I had my questions about his observations, he deflected them hoping to manage my reaction with simple apologies, except they weren't simple at all. He apologized, he criticized, and he apologized again. There was nothing more I could say, nor did I need to hear any more explanations from him. I thought about asking for his business card or his name, but instead I just walked away, feeling exposed. I had to consider my daughter's feelings as well, uh, as well as my own. My 17-year-old, usually the stoic one, told me she almost cried when she understood what he was asking. And all the while I kept wondering, as he overreached when he approached us, or was he just being a good citizen, looking out for the welfare of two young women? Perhaps he was doing what his professional training had taught him to do, look for things that seem out of place, and act on those observations. But what is normal and what is not? Even if he thought something inappropriate was taking place, he certainly could have approached us more gently. What a beautiful family you have there, he might have said to me. If the girls had answered, we're not his family, or had even looked distressed by his statement, then he might have 
had cause to question them instead of his words were so intrusive, controlling and damaging. I would be remiss if I didn't question them. A week later in the ferry ride home as my oldest and I were walking on the deck, I suggested that we imagine other passengers through this man's eyes. She grimaced but agreed. It was so easy to project suspicious stories under the white women trying to grab a black child instead of seeing a mother run after her son or to suppose that an old man was taking inappropriate photos of a young girl. Instead of seeing a grandfather capturing a special moment with his granddaughter, we talked about this as we walked around the deck. The world and its suspicions had intruded on our family's vacation. As we crossed Delaware, Delaware Bay, racial profiling became personal that day, and while our experience was minimally, minimal compared to the constant profiling experienced by others, it left a repugnant taste in my mouth. Homeland Security instructs Americans, if you see something, say something. But at what point do our instincts compel us to act? And when does our fear of getting involved stop us? What causes someone to perceive one thing when an entirely different thing is happening? I've been thinking about this for weeks and I have no clear answers. And that's what disturbs me the most. Wow. That is a that is a rather uh, heartfelt letter. I, I I don't know what that's not the word I want to put to it. It's a compelling letter. It's a you know, oops. Um, you know, look like like I said, if if it were me, I would have approached. Hey, it's a nice day. How you doing? You know, I wouldn't. Huh, hey, man, are you? You know. Uh, are they for sale? I mean, am I going to just want those? Or are they, are they for I mean, come on. Let's get real. We need to stop in this country. Not everybody is a monster. The whole stranger danger thing is unbelievable. You know? I mean, in, in ways, there are tons of monsters in this country, but it's mental monsters. They're, they're, they're monsters in their mind. Not in their actions, you know, and and I hope I hope those listening have an understanding of what I mean by that. You know, we we have to just we we have to stop the the mentality that's going on, or else none of us will be free. We shouldn't be free to do bad things. We should, you know. And I don't think that a majority of the people out there even have any interest in doing anything bad. But you have to let the good people deal with the bad people. And stop just accusing everybody of being bad. Stop stop the the treatment that you're you know, you're guilty until proven innocent. Because that's what's going on. It's exactly what's going on. It's it's sick. It's absolutely sick. Wow. Okay, let's move on. Police state America, two children charged with felonies for peeling bark from a tree. Yeah, you heard me right. Police in Mason City, Iowa recently arrested two children and charged them with a felony criminal mischief for stripping bark from a tree in front of their school. A neighbor with nothing better to do with their time witnessed the children peeling the bark from the tree and felt the need to call the police. See what I'm saying? The police actually took the call seriously and showed up to treat the children like criminals. The police interrogated the children who eventually admitted to peeling the bark off of the tree. When they confessed and charged them with second degree criminal mischief. Yet a cop can beat or kill or something, a, a citizen, you know, and they get a promotion and a pat on the back. There's nothing worse than seeing my 13-year-old son turn right, left, and front as his mugshot is taken. My heart is hurting for my son. I don't believe it had to go to this uh, extreme, Mother Naomi Wells told the Global Gazette. I guess as a parent, I should be at fault for not teaching him that pulling bark off of a tree will kill it. I made sure to cover sex, drugs, drinking, responsibility, honesty, and God. But trees, that one slipped my mind, she added. 
The charges filed against the children were based on the cost of removing and replacing the tree, which came to $1,166. If the cost of the tree was lower, then the charges against the children would not have been as steep. However, Ms. Wells did some research on her own and got a quote from a local tree company that totaled around $475. If the police got a quote from the same company that Naomi Wells did, then the children would have not have been charged with felonies. When asked about the high projected cost to replace the tree, Mason City Police Sergeant Dave Hauser said, I thought it was high to begin with, but how do you come up with the cost of a tree? Wow. Ridiculous. That's our country now. You know, I'm not saying nothing should have been, I mean, but come on, you know. I mean, come on. You know, kids don't do that. You can kill the tree, you know. And that, that's anything we can do. You know, and then these, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what do you say? What do you say? I don't even know what to say anymore. It's ridiculous. A, a comic book story to tell you, I guess you could say. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end the show tonight. Um, I'll play the video. And I, I'm sure I'll have something or two to say. <laughs> it's ridiculous. New at 530, Illinois Governor Pat Quinn is taking a big pay cut this week. Quinn plans to take the minimum wage challenge, living only on the state minimum wage of $8.25 an hour. That's about $79 the entire week. It's part of his plan to promote raising the state's minimum wage, and it's a large part of the governor's re-election campaign. It's almost like it's a joke. Like it's playing a joke on the people. All right, let's break this down. <clears throat> Quinn has made raising Illinois' minimum wage a cornerstone of his re-election campaign against Republican challenger Bruce Rauner. On Sunday, the governor announced at a campaign, campaign event that he would limit his spending on food and other expenses for the next week to $79. First of all, people making minimum wage... You know, the ones that aren't getting government assistance because they're working full-time making minimum wage and they, uh, they, they are overqualified to get any help. They don't have an extra $79 a week. All right, so let's get rid of that number to begin with. And then let's throw in the simple fact that you can't do this for one week, brother. Do this for about six months. And then talk about raising minimum wage. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, I agree. I think it needs to be raised. I mean, I'm I'm in in that corner. But this guy is just doing this for looks. He's just doing this for appearance. He's not doing this to prove a point, other than he really, really wants to get reelected. That's it. That's it. It's ridiculous. It's pandering. I, I guess that's the right use of the word pandering, is it? If it's, if it's not, I apologize. It's silly. I know it's the right use of the word silly. Really, we need to get this guy out. If you live in Illinois, do not vote for Quinn. I don't care if you're a Democrat or not. I, I don't, you know. If there's a third party candidate, please vote third party. Please. Otherwise, vote for this. Bruce Bruce guy, I don't I don't know, but get Quinn out. This this the state of Illinois has been ran by Democratic crooks for entirely too long. And if you doubt that, take a look at where they tend to wind up. That's all you gotta do. And they keep electing. Democrat after Democrat after Democrat. For Christ's sake, where do you think Obama came from? <laughs> oh. You know, back in 2008, I, I've said it before, and I deeply apologize, but I voted for Obama, and I apologize for that. And I had a buddy of mine that told me that he voted for, or not that he voted, uh, that, that Obama was part of the quote-unquote Chicago machine. And, uh, you know, whatever. Because I don't get involved in the partisan crap. I don't, I, pardon the word, but 
I don't wave a flag of any kind. I just don't. We got to do something, folks. I mean, the answer's not in politics at all. The answer's in the streets. I mean, that's the only way we're going to win. We're going to have to take the streets, and we're going to have to to get rid of all these crooks, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or third party. We got to get rid of it all. Start fresh. Find people that don't want to be in those positions and put them there. Just like they did George Washington. That's what I got for you. That's tonight's show. May God bless you. May he walk with you. I love you all. Be one with your spirit. And I will see you tomorrow night. Good night, folks. <laughs>